Is anybody seeing me now? Hello, everybody? Am I here? Hello, everybody. I want to know if anybody can see me because we're having technical problems here. Yes, I'm finally here. More saying yes. More saying yes. Please say yes. You see me? Oh, thank God. So <laughs> I guess I get to start over again. Yay. Isn't that nice? Okay. So my apologies. As I say, this is what this is new to me. Um, all the technology stuff is very new to me. So anyway, we'll start over again. And now that everybody knows I'm here. Whew. Okay. Any rate, I want to say thank you for waiting patiently. Um, hoping that anybody else that comes to view this will then say, gee, why is there a black screen for like five minutes and she's not coming on? That's going to suck. But anyway, um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, and as I w w pointed out when you didn't see me, I wanted you to subscribe and like the video in spite of the fact you had to wait on me. Uh, so I like somebody saying that's yeah, the soul of, 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 of Chris Watts. It was just dark black and that would be kind of appropriate for for this topic <laughs> so anyway what i want to talk about today is the issue of first of all the chris watts case it's a fascinating case and there's a lot of people who are really really interested in it but before i get going on that i wanted to do a disclaimer about what happens um with youtube videos and should people make money off of them and should they make money off the chris watts case and why I'm also going to talk about some of the some of the YouTubers that are doing stuff on the Chris Watts case because it's very important. Um, first of all, I want to say everybody has the right to earn money on YouTube. It's a lot of work. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you, I've only done this for a week and a half, and it takes a lot. You have to get the equipment, and then the equipment doesn't work, and you got to get new lights, and then you have this problem and that problem, and you have to figure out how to work things and not have a black screen for five minutes on your live. Um, you have to figure out how to do all this stuff. And then you've got to put a tremendous amount of effort into it. You've got to do research. You've got to do, oh, I, I can't tell you. So if somebody comes on here and wants to make money by being a YouTuber, and by the way, it's very difficult. You have to have a tremendous amount of subscribers and a lot of views before you start making even a few pennies. And most people never earn anything. Uh, and there are some people who don't want to earn. Uh, they just want to come on and, and, and share something with the public. And that's fabulous. But I'm not going to knock people who are YouTubers. Uh, there are some YouTubers who put out great content. I watch that great content. I love travel stuff. I, I, I learn all about the world. Right now I'm doing a, uh, it's a YouTube, um, I'm us using my, uh, um, my treadmill and I've got these walking tours and I went walking through Egypt and I went walking through Dubai and, and it was really fun. And uh, instead of just, just walking to music, I got to actually walk through an area and hear all about the location. Somebody had to do all that work. And if I subscribe or contribute, I think that's perfectly fine. I'm thankful for the content. So, and there's some YouTubers who've just become massively wealthy because they're very popular. Bully for them. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to argue that. Uh, and, but here's the one thing that has happened along the way. There are certain people who know, trying to make money on YouTube will do anything. They will put out content that they know that people are obsessed with, or perhaps they're like Pied Pipers and mislead people. And they're going to throw little crumbs down every single video and say, you've got to come to the next video. I've got more information. And they keep people glued and they get those, those viewing hours that add up to their money. And so there is a problem with that uh, in the sense that they're not putting out content, which is accurate They're and they're, developing vigilante groups going after certain people who have not been proven to be guilty of anything. And so we're going to talk about some of those folks later on in this broadcast. But first, we're going to talk about you know, how we got there to have vigilante groups going after people, especially in the Chris Watts case, um, and the, particularly after, after his girlfriend uh, that he was involved with. They're going after her with, with a lot of energy, shall we say, and she has to stay in hiding because of this, and I think that's pretty horrifying. And so I'll talk about also just family annihilators in general. So at any rate, so here we are. Now let's start, I'm going to start with a Chris case, uh, but it's not going to be Chris Watts. I'm going to start with somebody else, and 
I don't know how many of you know of this particular guy, but let's see if you know him. Let's see. Let me find the guy for you. It is this fellow. Tell me if you know of him. Does he look familiar to you? How many of you know that guy? Wait, that's the wrong way. This guy. His name is Chris. And his wife's name is Sherry. I don't know what's up with the Chris and the wives with sh on their names. But Chris and Sherry. This is the Chris Coleman case. And he is actually he actually happened in 2009. So um, so in 2000, thank you, Christine. I appreciate that. That's very nice of you. And oh yes, I agree with this. Yeah. Quite happy for people to make money if they're respectful and stick to the facts. This is absolutely true. So let's let's talk about Chris Coleman because he's another Chris who annihilated his entire family. And for the what looks like the same reasons as we have with Chris Watts, that he was involved with somebody. Uh, in this case, his right, I can't get my right and left on here, right? It is his wife's one of her friends, and he was involved with her for a year before he decided to knock off his family. Now, so who was Chris Coleman? So back in about 2009, a little earlier, actually, Chris Coleman worked for Joyce, um, and I forgot her name, I'm gonna have to look over here because she's a famous, uh, um, um, Joyce Mayer, Joyce Mayer. She had a huge ministry and she traveled all over the world and he was her top security dude. And he made a lot of money and was doing very, very well, had a good lifestyle. He'd been married to his wife, I think it was somewhere like uh, 12, 13 years. His sons were 11 and nine. And he looked like a great guy. Everybody said he was a great guy. He did baseball with his sons and all that kind of stuff and just looked wonderful. So what happened? So we have this guy and supposedly, this is this is the claim of what happened, that Joyce Meyer, or Mayer, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, she, since she had a Christian ministry, she didn't really want to have people in her employ that supposedly she didn't want them in her employ if they divorced their, their wives and dumped their families. So that was the theory behind why he decided he had to eliminate his family if he wanted a divorce. But at any rate, about six months before his family was murdered, he started getting, let me put quotes on this, he started getting letters at work and then at the home saying, if you don't, uh, if you don't leave your, if you don't leave Joyce Meyer, I'm going to kill your family. I mean, really weird stuff. And people are like, oh, that's just so scary. And it, it's so absolutely terrible. And it, and it's continued up until right before something happened to them. So one day he went to the gym. He got up in the early morning and went to the gym. And because he was worried about his family, he supposedly he called up the next door neighbor who was a cop. And he said, hey, you know, um, I can't get hold of them and they should be home. I mean, I left to go to the gym and it's early morning. They're not answering the phone. Could you go over and check on them? So the cop goes over, next door neighbor goes over and he checks on them and they're all dead. They've been brutally stabbed and there's, 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 this place is a mess. There's writing on the wall, evil things on the wall about how I told you I get them, you know, uh, and it was a horrifying scene. And then he, he's told that, you know, his wife and children have been killed. And he didn't seem terribly interested in how they were killed. And he had these scratches on his arm. He was kind of like trying to cover up. And, and the funny thing about it in a very sad way is that apparently this dude should have studied a little more about crime scenes and about forensic pathology because when, when the police went in and found his family, now remember, he, he said he just went to the, it was like five in the morning, he went to the gym and they were like killed within the next 30 minutes while he was gone. But apparently his family was like this. So like they, they're like, Whoa, these guys weren't killed 30 minutes ago. These guys were killed like two to three hours ago. And so obviously, Chris, you were home at the time. And so anyway, he failed in his mission and uh, he went to prison. But the question was, why did he do this horrible thing? This supposed family man, why would he do this? Okay, so here's his wife. He's got his wife and a friend. He hooked up with a friend. A, a year goes on. And apparently... A day before this actually happened, the the girlfriend said to him on a telephone call, doesn't this sound familiar like with the Chris Watts case? It sounds so familiar, right? So on the phone call, he, she's like, you know, hey, dude, it's been it's been over a year now. You know, we've been, you know, you know, scurrying around and 
you know, I, I, I'm kind of done with this. If you, you know, do you want to, are you going to leave your wife, get a divorce or aren't you, you know, because I'm tired of being the, the mistress. And then the next day they're all dead. So now the question is, is she guilty of causing the deaths of this family? And here's my point on that. How many men have had mistresses? How many people, you know, the, fam the, 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 the marriage has gone bad, has gone downhill. And of all those hundreds of thousands of people, how many men just kill off their families because they want a divorce? I mean, it, it's so, so rare that I'm sure that there's been many, many women who have said, look, are you going to get the divorce or not? I'm not going to keep hanging out with you if you're not going to get the divorce. Uh, you say you've been separated for, let's say, a year and I've been dating you. And are you going to go back to your family or are you going to get a divorce and be with me? What it, hey, that's what you call an ultimatum. OK, fine. I mean, everybody has the right to say that and it certainly doesn't usually cause the entire annihilation of a family. So this is completely nonsense, you know, absolute nonsense that this woman was the cause of that. In other words, there is nothing that will cause you to murder your family except that you're a psychopath who has determined that you're basically tired of having that family. Uh, you want a new kind of life. For whatever reasons, that life amused you until that point, and now they're in the way. And that's what psychopaths are all about. You're either useful or you're in the way. There is a kind of no in-between on that. And you might say, well, wouldn't, wouldn't a wife realize that, that she had married a psychopath? And the answer is no, because a lot of times we make excuses for those who we're with, who, those whom we love, those whom we have kids with, and we and we want to give them a little bit of a break. You know, we're not perfect people. You know, you know, we, you know, we we all have issues sometimes where where we have fights and and maybe we're selfish or we're this or we're that. Uh, so what will happen a lot of times in a relationship where you're in a relationship with a psychopath is they're very slick. At, at manipulating and also making you feel guilty and making you feel like you're the you're the one who's in the wrong. They're very good with that. So what happens is a person just seems to, you know, it, you get so sucked into it. It's very hard to realize what you're in, uh, and therefore you don't know how to get out of it because you keep trying to use rational ways of getting out of it. Like we could see a marriage counselor, or maybe if I'm just nicer, maybe if I just make him dinner more, have more sex with him, maybe that will change everything. But, you know, a psychopath is a psychopath. And when they're finished with you and aren't interested in you anymore or the children, because they've all served your purposes, they might just walk out. They might just divorce. Or if you've got a particularly concerning kind of psychopath, they might just say, well, I'm done. And I'd just rather get rid of them because I don't want to pay child support. And I don't want to have to deal with my ex-wife. And I don't want to have to see the kids anymore because that's going to ruin my new lifestyle, you know? So. It's not like that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a look at some a couple of your comments here. What are you talking about here? Okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh so I'm, some comment here. I'm not sure what this comment is all about, so I'm gonna put it on the screen. I think she needs to get down on her knees and thank God she wasn't his next victim. Because as soon as a younger, prettier replacement, oh yeah, her days will be numbered. Well, that is true. And it is interesting because a lot of times when a person gets involved with a psychopath, not realizing it, um, and maybe let's say they actually get away with killing their family. Yeah, it's there are people who the men who have actually killed off more than one wife. So that is very true. And if you don't understand what you're dealing with, you know, yeah, you may be next on the list. Absolutely. That is true. So <laughs> so you really want to try not to get try not, not to get involved with one of them. Anyway, let's go to now, I want to go to our Chris Watts, our next fella, and what he did with his family. So let's take a look with his family. Okay, so now he, very similarly to the, the other Chris. So you see, this is not an isolated incident. Uh, I wish it was. I wish this, this kind of thing never happened, but unfortunately it does. And we have another Chris, and again, it looks like Things are happy. He's married for quite a while. They have children. And, and you gotta admit, you know, you look at the videos with him and his kids. I mean, he looked like a good daddy. He did. I mean, you know, he did. You know, and of course, in my opinion, I thought he was damn handsome. 
Uh, not everybody might think so, but oddly, I, I really think that's a damn good looking man. So you can understand why he can attract women. Uh, but you know, I've seen though not so attractive men attract women too. So yeah, it isn't a prerequisite for a psychopath to get somebody. Uh, but anyway, he got these. He got himself a wife, and he got himself some kids. And interesting enough, he moved away from his family and her family. So in a way, she was isolated. Uh, Shanann was isolated with him, and uh, and we don't really know what went on behind closed doors. And so. One of the things, oh, somebody asked this question. I think it's good, Roberta. You asked, do not, do you think about, do, oh, do they not think ahead about being caught? You know, they think they're really smart. That, that's one of their problems. They're so narcissistic. They think they're brilliant. They think, oh, I got this. I got this under control. I, I know I can get away with this. If they didn't think they could get away with it, they wouldn't do it. But because they're so arrogant, that's what we see with the, with the Chris Coleman case. He's so arrogant. Okay, okay, I'll set up this whole scene. I'll set up the fact that somebody's going to kill them, you know. And he got away with that for quite well because they didn't actually connect him to those letters. Then he's got the plan. I'm going to go away to the gym, and they'll be killed while I'm gone. I've got that all set up. He just didn't understand about what happens to the body after it expires. He did not understand about rigor mortis, and so he blew it because. You should have studied more. Only you don't want to study on the computer. You don't want to get on your computer and start, you know, you know, doing your Google searches. Rigor mortis. How soon does that set in? <laughs> because that can lead back to you as well. And interestingly, a lot of people get caught that way because when they're exploring things, they don't think about the fact that they're after they they're actually going to do it. And so then they do it, and then they they have this whole trail they've left of all their explorations on Google. So that's always kind of amusing. And that, that is a good way to catch them. So, um, so anyway, so Chris Watts has got the situation. And here's the first thing um, I want to say about, you know, we get into the now into the issue of why did he do it? Did his girlfriend, Nicole, did she push him into it? And if she hadn't been there, would he have done it? And this is where all the stuff on the internet starts. And this is where uh, the problems come in. So let me first say again, we have a psychopath here. Psychopaths aren't pushed into anything by anybody. They, especially the one that's as, as, as you know, strong as Chris Watts in the way that he, he can do things and take care of things. Um, he, he's gonna make his own decisions. And nobody's going to make him do a damn thing. Uh, so if if it hadn't if he hadn't hooked up with Nicole, he would have hooked up with somebody else to get rid of his boring married life. His you know his his or he may just have because he wanted out of that marriage. He may just not have wanted to pay child support or deal with those kids or deal with the ex-wife. He may have gotten rid of them anyway. And then gosh, oh, just think about it. Oh, let's say Nicole wasn't in the picture. And he decides, uh, you know, I just want to be free. I want to be a single man because I'm really, I'm a, I'm a lot better looking than when I got married. Because if you see him when he was uh, at a wedding, he's a little chubbier. He wasn't as good looking. And then he lost weight. He started, I guess he's lifting weights because his body was really nice. So he probably thought, okay, I'm hot now. And I'm stuck with the wife, the two kids. Oh, and she's pregnant too. So God almighty, I got to go through all of that again. So if Nicole wasn't in the picture, do you not think, and I want your opinion on this, don't you think it's very likely that he could just say, hey, if I get rid of them, I can start my life anew. I can be free. I can start dating again, all kinds of hot women. And guess what happens if you actually get away with this? Can you imagine? He wakes up, the kids are gone, the wife is gone. Oh, they've all run off. And they're found wherever they're found or never found is what he wanted. So... Do you know what happens to guys like like him as soon as they start going on TV and saying, you know, my wife and children are gone? They start getting, oh, emails. They start getting fan mail from all kinds of women. Oh, Chris, I feel so sorry for you. Oh, my God, you know, you poor dear. You've lost your children. I want to be there to help you. You know, you get that. He would have women just in droves coming around him. He would get so much sympathy. So you, Nicole, 
is hardly going to be the reason he killed off his family. He's going to have all the reasons for killing off his family, which is just to be free. So that's the first thing I want to point out, that he is going to do what he is going to do. Now, now there's a lot more evidence on this. But first, before I go into the evidence on that, I want to talk about what's happening online, because I think this is really important. And we, we need to talk about this. So let me see if I can find all these little things I have found um, from these different people. Okay, I'm not going to name these particular folks, okay? I just want to point out what they're doing, and then I want to point out why they're very, I'd say misguided, but I think they're misguiding. So I'm going to go with misguiding people, and it's very, very con concerning to me. Let me start with just something simple. Here's one. Okay, this this uh, this person's they're 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 jumping in uh, because and they're probably jumping in because it is just a case that will you talk about you make some money right and then we get to this particular woman now she has she's got a huge YouTuber huge YouTuber she has a bunch of channels she has a huge number of followers I mean huge and she's jumped in on this and she'll say things like I I don't want anybody to feel uh, to hate anybody. I'm just, I find this case just really fascinating. And she's really good at just saying, don't you think that's interesting? Oh my goodness. What do you think that means? And she has a very large following, but is, is re really what good is it doing? Except it is exciting. She is doing the, I think Nicole could be involved. I think Nicole could have pushed him into it. I think Nicole this, Nicole that. Oh my God, it could have been Nicole who, you know, maybe she did was involved in killing the kids off. Maybe she was involved in killing off Shanann. Maybe she, maybe she just planned it with her. She's all into it, and so are her viewers, and that she's riling her viewers up, and she's bringing them back over and over and over again. It keeps her money coming in at the same hand. It's a real disaster as far as, you know, as, far as victimizing somebody. And let's go to this, our other fellow here. Now... A lot of you know who this is. Um, I don't really want to give him any publicity, but uh, here he is, and he is—he has been going on and on and on about how um, Nicole is guilty. He believes she's actually involved in the actual homicides, and he points out some really stupid stuff. But before I get into what some of the stupid stuff he points out, um, here he is with an author, and I'm not going to name her book because I don't think it's worth reading. She apparently had some communications with Chris when he was in prison, and now she's written some stuff. And again, it's not necessarily based on evidence, but just, hey, look what it said. Look what he said. Oh, maybe he's not. Maybe that, and maybe this, and maybe that. Okay, whatever. Basically, they're just in there to talk stuff and, and lead people down a path that's not true. And worse, here he's got, this is the kind of thing which, you know, <laughs> I looked in and I said, what in the heck? So anyway, proof that Chris Watts had help. And of course, it's all big, big and bright letters. And we have this car. He's got this video. And the car pulls up to the house. And there's something about a light that, you know, shouldn't be there if there was nobody in the passenger seat. And I'm like, so you're taking this little piece of light. And look what I found. And, and now you see that proves Nicole was there. And she helped. And then there's something about pants, legs, and what people are wearing, and in these, these this video, it's it's a lot of nonsense. It's a lot of nonsense. But he doesn't care if it's nonsense because it is sucked people in. And this is the biggest probably vigilante group going after Nicole and why she has to stay in hiding because they have pronounced her guilty of homicide, of murder, maybe even more than one murder, maybe both the kids or Shanann, who knows what they think she's done. And so they have just really ripped her apart. Now, I want to say that what's interesting is I really had never heard, really looked into the girlfriend at all. I mean, I, I knew Chris Watson killed his family a long time ago, and that was that. But I was brought, this was brought to my attention. And so I thought, okay, fine. I'm going to take a look. I'm going to take a look at, 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 the, at this Nicole, and I'm going to see... What have we got here? Have we got a situation where, um, and I'm trying to find, where is she here? Where's she gone to? Oh, there she is. Okay. Um, all right. Here we are with in the interview room. 
And where'd my interview room? Can somebody see my interview room? Where'd my interview room go? Help, my interview room is gone. That's interesting. Oh, I forgot to take this off. Okay, there we go. Interview room. I'm still working out the technical problems. I don't understand this machinery yet. Anyway, here we are in the interview room. Now, by the way, I'm not going to show a full picture of her. I'm not going to show a close picture of her, which is why I picked this one in the interview room. I'm not even going to talk about Nicole's last name because I just don't think it needs to be done uh, because she has never been labeled. She has never been labeled a suspect. So there we go. Um, yeah, but there, there's a good point. That's exactly right. Angela she says, he is a scam artist, a con man, and is responsible for whipping up drama. It's all lies. And this is not the only person. He's pretty bad. But as, as I pointed out, there's other people who are doing this as well. And so, but the problem is a lot of times, quite frankly, they're believed. And, and that they're, therein lies the problem. Oh, there's one more. I wanted to bring this one more out before... Um, before I go on about what I actually analyzed in the interview, there is one more person. Where did he go? Um, there is a guy who's doing, hmm, it's not this one. Oh, no, that's him again. Oh, yeah, there he is. Okay, Mr. Body Language Guy. Now, um, this guy is doing body language. All right, now... I looked, I looked the fellow, I looked the fellow up. Okay. And I will have to say, I, I couldn't find any, um, hold on a second here. I am trying to get something done here. Okay. All right. Um, this guy, um, I, I took out his name. Um, I looked up his background. I can't find any professional background on him. However, I will say, I, I don't require that of people. I mean, if people have studied something and they're good at it, uh, I'm not going to say you can't have the right to talk about it, um, as long as you don't misrepresent yourself. He says I'm a body, I'm a body language analyst. He can say he's a body language analyst, and he did do. He has all the right words and stuff like that, so I can't say he has to study body language. Apparently, he has. He's got a lot of videos about a lot of cases, and a lot of videos about this case. And he has he has watched the same interview I've watched. But what's fascinating is he comes, he says, oh, you can see, for example, she's leaning back in the chair, so she's stressed. Okay. He's not entirely incorrect. And sometimes, but sometimes they'll say, well, this could, it could be this or it could be that. It could be this or it could be that. And he goes on through the, through the uh, whole interview. And then he says something very interesting at the end. His conclusion at the end is that Nicole was not involved with the murders, but she, she planned them with Chris. And I'm like, whoa, that's what you got out of this? Really? That's what you got out of this? Okay, then. Uh, that is not what I got out of it. I can tell you that. So what did I get out of it? So anyway, what's really interesting is when I was asked or told about this particular case, um, as I said, I, I never really looked at Nicole particularly because I wasn't really concerned about that. And when I went to listen to her interview uh, with the police, I expected I was going to see a lot of questionable stuff because everybody was saying, oh, my God, she's involved. She's involved. And I was surprised that I felt I not only felt, but I saw none of these things. I did not see deception. I saw an interview where the, well, she was being as blatantly honest as I've seen a person be blatantly honest, except for one thing, which which is stand out for me, which was about the phone call she had on the night before. Other than that, I did not catch deception any place. What I caught in the whole thing was, let me start over what I think happened with Nicole. Because, you know, a lot of people just want to hate a girlfriend or a mistress when somebody's married. And I get it. I mean, it's it sucks, you know, that anybody interferes with any kind of marriage. When I got divorced, my rule was this. I won't even I won't even look at you or date you unless you have the paper. Hold up the divorce certificate. And I want it to be from a while back, so I'm not like a, you know, <laughs> you know, just I'm the, you're the you're desperate. And I'm going to be the next one. I want to know that you're settled in your life. You're okay. You, your family's okay. And then I'll get involved with you. Uh, so I I never believed in uh, ever ever uh, dating somebody who was only separated or claimed he was separated. But 
let's face it, a good portion of women will, and it's not because they're bad people. It's because they believe that they're not doing anything bad because the marriage is over. They believe this. So here we have Nicole. She's working at the same company as Chris. They start chit-chatting. He's a handsome dude, as I said. He's not a bad-looking guy. They start chit-chatting. He's very, he's very personable. And I, I look at some of the, just the texts he sent back to Shanann when they're back and forth, and they're always very pleasant. So he's good at being pleasant. He's good at being uh, a nice guy to be around, shall we say, at least to an extent, at least maybe to you married him. But, uh, oh, just by the way, I just got a comment on this one. <laughs> I, always, I find this amusing me because you're talking about this one particular fellow who uh, has the uh, the show that's really, really pushing that Nicole is guilty and a, hum and a murderer. Uh, and, and, and Desiree is saying, yeah, uh, his subs believe him. How his subs believe him, beggars believe. And, you know, I find it funny because the word subs here is subscribers. But in most of the world, subs means submissive. Uh, so, you know, and what are submissives? People who will basically uh, denigrate themselves in front of others, who will fall for things, who will, who will allow their master to control them. So just saying, maybe subs in this instance doesn't mean subscribers. <laughs> anyway, back to Nicole. So, okay, so Nicole is at work. She's met Chris. They're having chit chats. Uh, and then he said, you know, he shows that he's got a couple of daughters and he talks about them. And she thinks, oh, that's cute because, hey, let's face it, if you're not married at 20 these days, oftentimes when you meet somebody, they already have kids. That's just the way it is. You're, 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 you're stuck in a situation where they already have kids and you either have to accept that or you may never, never get married. So, uh, so she's, he's got kids and she says, oh, well, that's cute. And he talks nice about them. So she thinks it's sweet. But then the conversations go on. And he finally lets her know that the marriage is on the rocks and she, they're basically going to get divorced and he's sleeping in the basement. All right. And that's what a lot of married men do tell women to get, get them, you know, to hang out with them. Uh, some are telling the truth and some are lying and some are just making it up completely. They have no intention of divorcing anybody, but they want to, they want their phone on the side. But then there are guys who truly are, the marriage is doing poorly and they are sleeping in the basement. And in this particular case, I believe Chris was sleeping in the basement. I, I think that was not a lie. And I think his marriage was doing poorly, as we have seen through, through a number of text messages and through the horrifically sad letter that, uh, that Shanann left him when she went out of town to the groveling, begging letter. Oh, please, please, honey. You know, I want to be with you. Please don't break up our family. She wanted to keep the marriage alive. He apparently did not. So he wasn't really telling an untruth when he told Nicole that he was sleeping in the basement. And Nicole was then, when she talked to him and he was late at night talking to her freely, it meant to her that he, he, he wasn't lying about that. His wife was not next to him in bed and he was able to sleep, you know, he's in the basement so they could talk. So at some point she decided, you know, they started hanging out because she thought his marriage was, was over. And they were just working out the details of separation. So that came across as pretty much what I thought was happening. Um, and then they had, there was an interesting statement where Nicole said she went to his house one time when I guess Chanel was out of town in, in North Carolina. And she saw that the beautiful home. She saw the pictures of the family on the wall and all the little girls and everything. And basically, she at that point, she kind of hit her in the face. She goes, Ugh, you know. Hey, hey, Chris, seems to me like you've got this great family and this great life. What the heck? Maybe you should try to keep it. Maybe you should, maybe you should keep this life. And she tried to, she said, I tried to step back at that point. Is that believable or not? Well, I would say a lot of people don't want to believe that. They say, oh no, she she didn't, she didn't really care about them. She shouldn't have been in the house, blah, blah, blah. But she came across as honest. She she's like, oh, you know. I, I don't want to pursue this right now. If, if you know, if your family can be together, I can, I can, I can walk away. It's only been, it hasn't been that long. We've been around each other. And, you know, maybe you just, if, if it's going to end, it's going to end and then we can get together. But Hey, maybe, maybe just try to fix it up. And supposedly he went to North Carolina to do so. And then supposedly she got the information that the, the attempt failed and he came back. Now here's the only part. Now, by the way, she had, there's some very interesting things about the conversation, which 
I again take differently than somebody else might. Um, and there is a she when she talks about the children a lot, she talks in the present tense like they're still alive. Now, this is really interesting because you know how sometimes when some somebody's kids gone missing, instead of saying something like, She's very oh, I, uh, my daughter, I, I want I want to find her. She's she's so beautiful. They'll say something like, Oh, I want to find my daughter. She is she was so beautiful. And you're like, was so beautiful? Why are you talking in the past tense about your daughter who's just supposed to be missing? You know, what do you mean? You know, that you know, suddenly, you know, you're talking in the past tense. So that is that's a clue. That is a clue. So wow, really? I got I gotta just put this one up because I'm like, seriously? Oh my lord. Now uh, that's an interesting one. There's one new creator that believes Chris Watts didn't kill anyone. <laughs> oh, good God. You know, yeah, this is how bad it gets sometimes where now you start believing a person who is a psychopath and murderer is suddenly, see, this is a person that's going to go, you know, if it's a female, she'll like visit, want to visit him in jail and then she'll marry him. You know, something horrifying like that. Oh, you know, it just gives you the creeps. But, um, so anyway, um, so anyway, she anyway. So anyway, this um, when Nicole talks about the kids and a number of the different events, she actually talks in the present tense, which is a little weird because you know it should be in the past tense. Instead of saying, for example, one of the little girls, they asked her, "Does she did she have allergies?" Says, "Well, she she's allergic to. Well, she's not allergic to anything anymore because she's dead, but she's saying she's allergic to." And she's so we have Nicole talking in the present tense about a lot of this and you're like why is she doing that now sometimes that can show guilt which it doesn't match reality i mean i'm sorry not guilt guilt of committing a crime um for example when you talk in the past tense about your daughter who's gone missing or your son who's gone missing and you've actually killed them uh and you already know they're dead but in this case it's the reverse that she should be talking in the past tense she's talking in the present tense and one of the things this can show is that She's highly emotional and she's very sucked into thinking about that moment and she can't deal with the reality. And the reality is, and this is only like, you know, a few days ago, the reality is a few days ago, she thought maybe she was going to walk into the sunset with this guy and, you know, and he was just going to get divorced and she's going to be with this guy and the kids are cute and all that stuff. And now the kids are dead. The kids are dead. And she has got to feel, and she hasn't said, she feels a lot of guilt. And I know there's people out there are going to say, well, she should feel guilt. I mean, after all, you know, she was messing with a married man and she got him to kill the kids. No, no, no. She didn't get him to kill the kids. But like the other woman who was with the other Chris, what, who gave them that ultimatum, that two-hour phone call she had on that evening, it may be that Chris said to her, well, I don't think this is going to work out, blah, blah, blah. They had a long conversation. She said, well, you know, it's not going to work out. You should just get the divorce. You know, I'm not, I, I can't play this game with you. So if you want, if the marriage is over and you want, you know, want to go and want to be with me, fine. But if the marriage is not really over, I, you know, I, I just, I think I'm going to just, we'll just take a break. And, uh, you know, and she didn't mention what they talked about. And this is one people say, um, why doesn't she, why, how could she talk for two hours and not know what she talked about? And this is the only deceptive part I found. And people are assigning that, meaning she told Chris during those two hours to kill his family, <laughs> which I think is ridiculous. I, you know, think about it. I mean, just think about that reality. Okay. Now think about it. You, you tell your new boyfriend who you've known for like a few weeks, kill your entire family and some innocent children so we can now be together. Now, don't you think, first of all, he's got to get away with it. And nobody thinks that's an easy thing to get away with. And the next thing that's going to happen is the police are going to show up on your doorstep and you're going to be interrogated. And this is going to go on and on and on. And possibly your new boyfriend will go to prison. I mean, this, as far as I know, Nicole is pretty smart. She's a geologist. I listened to her whole conversation, uh, her whole interview. She comes across as very intelligent, very, she thinks things through very carefully. Uh, she, uh, even with him, she was thinking things through with him. When she mentioned that, uh, he, had, he was going to get himself an apartment. She said, well, you need to get near the kid's school so, you know, the kids can, you know, get back and forth. I mean, pretty, pretty smart woman. So you, all of a sudden she's just going to say, kill your whole family. That ought to work out really great, you know. Then we'll be together. No, I don't think so. But that she said, 
you know, you got to make your choices, buddy. You know, <laughs> you're either going to stick with your family and make it work or you're going to get you're going to get separated because I, I can't keep helping you out here. And my guess is she doesn't really want to talk about that because she does feel guilty. Like, my God, maybe I did push him into it because you're always going to feel that way, even if it's not true. So she's got to live with a huge amount of guilt. That, and, and there's one point where she cries and um, uh, uh, what, what Shirley say here? Cheryl says over here, I don't think she told him that he, he needs to shit or get off. I'm going to say that shit or get off the pot. I don't think for a second she even ever thought, oh, no, no, no. He never, she never would. Nobody's going to think, you know, if you say, hey, you know, you, you know, you might want to make a, make a choice. That's, he's going to then kill the family. I mean, that's not your thought. Nobody's going to think that. That, uh, But I do think she might have said you got to kind of make, make a choice at some point. Now, I may be wrong about that, but I think because she doesn't want to really talk about that two-hour conversation, I think she might have, during that time, at least brought up the subject that he had to make make some decisions in his life. So that's just my personal opinion on why that would be, my, my professional opinion, even, why that would be so. Um, but there's a point where she cries, and I wanted to point out this because this is really sad, um, that there are people, when she starts crying in this in this interview, I saw all these comments come in on a certain person's page. Oh, see, it's fake. It's fake. She's faking it. She's faking it. Uh-uh. She was not faking it. What she is is a very strong woman who held herself together through the majority of the interview under very stressful conditions. She was trying to do what she was supposed to do, which was answer the questions, talk to the detectives, hang in there. She got to a point where she was talking about the children and she lost it. And she said, oh, two little children. And she feels guilty that she might, in her mind, have had some you know, part of getting those children killed. And I would feel the same way if I were her. I mean, it'll be a horrible thing. I don't know how, it's something you have to live with and it's a horrible thing to have to live with, even if it's not exactly true. Uh, so Lana says, uh, I thought they were having phone sex. <laughs> That's also possible, <laughs> you know? It's, it's a, you know, but you know, we have to look back to when people are kind of hot for each other, you know, they may talk about all kinds of things. They may do phone sex. They may just talk about silly stuff. They may talk about the future. We don't know. And all of it is an uncomfortable thing to discuss with a bunch of investigators, your personal things that you were doing. We do know that she did some sexy texting stuff that she was embarrassed about and didn't really want out in public. So that that's pretty, that's, that's not unreasonable to think that. But I think there, say, there could be, I say, there's a level, there's certainly a level of guilt she feels that the children were killed and that she was part of this equation. But what I'm trying to point out to everybody who wants to jump on that and say, see, she is guilty. She's guilty. Either she did it, which is zero evidence, zero, zero evidence that she murdered any children. There is zero evidence that she murdered Shannon. There's zero evidence that she and Chris were doing something together that night. Uh, and there's also zero evidence that she planned anything with with Chris to kill the children that she might've talked about, get, you know, get, your, get your act together or, you know, we just got, you got to make decisions and she feels guilty over that and guilty over involvement with them that I buy. Now I want to go back to just talking a little bit about one thing about Chris and what he actually did and why she definitely is not involved. Let me go find the, the two pieces of writing, which I wanted to share with you. Um, that's not writing actually. It's just a, comments. Okay. Let's see if I can find it. Up, up. I just want to point this out. Ronnie and Cindy Watts defended their son saying he was in an abusive marriage with a manipulative woman and that they had a very hard relationship with Shannon, according to the New York Post. Okay. I just want to point this out too, that they raised a psychopath. Sorry guys, you raised a psychopath and your psychopath son killed off his, his wife and two children. That has got nothing to do with him being a browbeaten husband. Let me tell you, you know, I love, it's really sad when you see the stuff against Shanann as well. And I do want to point that out because there's another whole group that says Shanann drove him to it. No, I'm sorry. Every marriage has its ups and downs and there's nothing wrong with a woman having some strength in the marriage and making decisions, especially if he's not making them. So, you know, it's just, it's just a normal marriage. 
And whether she was a strong woman or a weak woman or a, quote, domineering woman is not a reason a man suddenly kills her and the children. I'm sorry, that's not the reason. He's a psychopath. Oops, sorry about that. I have an alarm that went off, which makes no sense because I'm not getting up at this time of day. Um, so there is, there is no reason you can blame Shanann, Shanann for anything. That's just absolute nonsense. And I think it's appalling. But, you know, parents of serial killers, parents of wife abusers, parents of wife killers, and, and family annihilators, it's amazing what they will say. It's just, it's kind of sad. It really is sad. Let's see if I can find what, oh, okay. Here we go. Here is the Chris thing that I want to talk about. Chris claimed that if he was thinking that day in August 2018, the deaths wouldn't have happened. But letters he wrote goes against that claim. He writes of thinking to himself as he said goodnight to the girls the previous evening, that's the last time I'm going to be tucking my babies in. I knew what was going to happen the day before and I did nothing to stop it. This, this, this is something I actually truly, truly believe. I actually believe that is, that is the truth. Uh, he was totally planning to kill his entire family. It was not something, a spur of the moment thing, something he didn't know was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. He absolutely knew it was going to happen. So this guy, I always point to the wrong side. That's the side. So this guy, being a psychopath, wanted out of his marriage. He made the plan to kill the wife and children. We don't even know how long he had this in his head. But at that point, he made the decision. This was what he's going to do. And so next, I want to talk about when did he kill him? I mean, sorry, when did he kill the wife and children? And I think he made a really interesting statement, which I don't believe at all. Okay, <laughs> I'll tell you why I don't believe this nonsense. Chris said he rolled up Shenanan's body. It's basically saying he killed his wife. First, he says he, uh, first he says he, I can't remember how the order with this one. He kills Shanann, and then he's like, tries to suffocate the children with pillows, or he suffocates the kids with pillows and goes in to kill Shanann, but the girls woke up from being suffocated to death and came in and said, what are you doing, Daddy? And then he takes, as he says here, he rolls up Shanann's body in a sheet, puts it on the floor of the back seat of his truck before placing the two girls on the back seat. The dad said he didn't plan to kill his three- and four-year-old daughters, but drove out to an oil work site roughly 40 miles from their home. There he smothered his two daughters before dropping their bodies into separate oil tanks. Now, I think that's a crock. I absolutely think that's a crock. <laughs> You're going to tell me, this is, this is his excuse. He wants to say, you know, okay, once he had to admit he killed his wife, okay, I killed my wife, but the two kids are still alive. He didn't want to then admit that he just killed his kids in cold blood. So he just was taking his wife out to dispose of her. And then when he got there, he flipped out, realizing that he had these witnesses who would tell the police. And so he had to kill them. And it wasn't premeditated. He did it in a panic. Okay, bull, absolute bull. Because he actually says the day that the day before, he knew he was going to kill his children, which he did. He killed his children. So here is what I think happened. He suffocated his children and strangled his wife at home. Now, he may have been strangling his wife and his kids came in and saw him killing Shanann and go, no, daddy, what are you going to do that to me next? Yeah, that may be true. Because psychopaths take little pieces of information and weave them into a story that they want to tell. Sometimes partially true, but a lot of times just a bunch of bull. So you can't always believe everything that they say and in the order in which they say it. What's interesting to me is this, web, uh, is this site 40 miles away. He's taking these, these, these kids and his wife. Now, I say they're all dead when he puts them in the car, all right? Because it's, it's not fun to, can you imagine driving 40 miles with your shrieking, crying children? Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, I don't think so. I think they're dead. So he has time to just drive silently where he's going. And by the way, a place where he knows he's going to dispose of the bodies. Now, I think it's very interesting that the two girls end up in the oil tank and his wife ends up in a shallow grave. Now, why do we think that's true? Okay, why do we think that would happen? If you're gonna leave, I mean, the whole point of putting the two girls in the oil tanks is so their bodies will never be found, ever. So why would you bury your wife in a shallow grave on the ground? 
And here's my theory on that. He'd been to the site before. He knew what it was about. He knew there were oil tanks with, with openings on the top. I think the problem was he didn't realize how small those openings were. So he took his two kids up there, opened them up and stuffed them in and realized he could hardly get them through and realized he couldn't get Shanann's body through the, the, the top, those openings and oil tanks and said, ah, oh, crap, dang it. I can't get there here in here. But now what do I do? So then he just buried her in a shallow grave because he had no other option at that point. So this is the way people screw up. And this is what I think he did. I think he killed them at home, had plans to take all three of them, dump them in the oil tank. And, you know, if he'd gotten all those, all of them in the oil tanks, he might have gotten away with it because there was no blood in the house. And if their bodies were in those tanks, I don't know that they would ever have been found. Uh, that's, you know, it's not a bad choice for where to hide some bodies. And, how you know, nobody's ever going to see maybe, well, maybe one day. I don't know how the oil gets in the tanks, but maybe for a long time. Uh, but didn't work out because he failed to polygraph and you know, things went downhill from there. Uh, and But, you know, this is what he says is not necessarily true. So you have to be, understand that he will, psychopaths will change their stories all the time. Now, of course, he's, now he's, of course, he's found the Lord. He's become a Christian and now he's going to get fan mail. From lots of women and he's probably going to get that say free chris watts support group <laughs> because you've got people who honestly believe that now now that he they're going to believe he's innocent and the women around him drove him to it now by the way he said i want to point out what catalina says i'm going to answer some questions now he could have just divorced why did he have to do this i have no idea he's just disgusting and now he's trying to find jesus in prison right well again why doesn't he get divorced because divorce doesn't mean your responsibilities go away. He would have a, an ex-wife and people all know how that's not, that's work to have an ex. You know, you have to constantly communicate with him. Now you have to share custody or, you know, try at least pay for things. He liked his fancy lifestyle. He didn't want to have to support three children and an ex-wife and deal with all the stuff he had to deal with. You know, we're just gonna, you've got to deal with the house. You got to you know all this, all this stuff. It's just easier. Get rid of her and the kids. He wakes up tomorrow free, free. The house is his. I don't know if there's an insurance policy that might help out there. Uh, and, and he's free. He doesn't have any responsibilities except he can have fun now. So that's why you don't get divorced. I mean, because divorce is work, you know, and, and, keeping, and continuing to be a, a father is work. So much as we think, oh, that's hard to believe, that's just the way that, oh, I want to point out. So, Lash, that's a good comment you make here. Uh, Family annihilators usually kill themselves, but Watts probably thought too highly of himself. Actually, that's true, but that has not to do with the situation. Family annihilators a lot of times are men whose lives have fallen apart. Usually it comes with a financial uh, crash. They've lost their jobs. They, 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 they think everything's going down the toilet. They want to commit suicide. They want to get out of any dealing with anything, but they're such narcissists that they can't stand the concept of people going on without them. Oh, well, then my wife gets to go and she's going to live her life. And my kids are going to live lives. And I'm just going to, I'm the loser. I'm the big fat loser. So you take them all out and we all lose together. Yeah, yeah. So that's a kind of a different thing. Uh, so you don't kill yourself if you want a free life. You kill yourself if you don't want a life. So that's, that's why they do what they do there. Uh, Let's say here, uh, Judith, yes, I believe they all died in the house, probably killing the kids before Shanann got home. Um, so, you know, yeah, how, what order they died in is not really important. The, the, the plan was to kill them all. He wasn't just going to kill the kids and leave Shanann on it. So, because he wanted her out of the, his life too. So who, who he killed first doesn't matter. What's important is nobody helped him. <laughs> he did it because he wanted to do it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why, you know, he made, he made that decision for himself. Let me see if there's any other questions anybody has. She wasn't a suspect. Oh, yes. Let me, it's a good point here. She wasn't a suspect. She was being interviewed and her dad was there for moral support. That is, oh yeah. Um, that, somebody asked what was the reason her father would be there for a, a police interview. Correct. That wasn't an interrogation. She had called the police. Um, she was willing to come in. She was just, she wasn't just doing an interview. Uh, she was not a, a suspect at all. And there's no reason why she couldn't have her father there for support. So, you know, um, yeah. And they were getting information from her. I mean, the police wanted as much information as they could get. Some people think that the police gave her a plea deal and said, okay, if you, if you, if you get him in trouble, then, you know, we won't charge you with anything. 
I, I don't see any basis for that whatsoever. Not at all. Um, she was just doing the interview of her own free will. And of course, I would have probably come and talked to her anyway. But she was, I want to point out something uh, I thought. She was she was pretty willing to cooperate with everything without any kind of warrant to get things like your phone and stuff like that. She was embarrassed. The big fear she had was that the phone the messages would get out into the public and she would, you know, she was just embarrassed. And I can't blame her because most of us don't want our private life being put in public. The only other person she, she really wanted to protect seemed to be her friend, her lifelong friend that had been staying with her. She said, I don't want to get, I don't want him involved. Now I, I can understand that. She just, she felt so bad about this whole damn thing. You know, she didn't want to screw her friends up life too, because she knew all hell was going to break loose with her. And she was just didn't want to mess everybody else said. Um, yeah, this is, this is, uh, I really think this is true. So, uh, hi, 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 this. Um, Pat has said that, uh, Nicole suggested that they live near the school sign that she was being respectful for his circumstances. Yes. And respectful for the kids. Um, and that's one of the things I actually liked about her because she seemed to be relatively concerned about the children. It seemed like she had a pretty good family life herself. And she thought, you know, Hey, you know, you're getting divorced, but your kids shouldn't suffer. You should still spend time with your kids. Anytime you want to spend time with your kids, I'm willing to not to, you know, I'll take a step back. Oh, I forgot to mention this. This is my favorite, favorite thing that she said, which was one of the reasons I kind of like the girl. Um, uh, she said, um, I did, they asked her if, if she, she had been, met the children, if, he, if Chris had introduced her to the children. She said, no, I did not want to be introduced to the children unless I was a permanent part of his life. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. But she said, I don't think children basically should, you know, meet girlfriends, you know, in the early days because you don't know what's going to happen. And it's just that's just not healthy for the children. I think I shouldn't be involved with them unless we know it's a permanent ongoing thing. I totally respect that because uh, a lot of girls, a lot of women and men, they will bring home their the guy they met at the bar last night, you know, and they'll bring him into the house and the children are already like, Oh, it's Uncle Joe, you know, and and the guy stays there and molests the children, whatever he does. But even if he's a nice guy, he's there for maybe three or four months, and then they have a fight, and then he's gone. And then you know, six months later, oh look, it's Uncle Uncle Mikey now. You know, and Uncle Mikey comes in, and again, the woman's only known him for a month, and he's already moved in. And the kids go through, I know, boyfriends and girlfriends that they shouldn't have to go through unless it's a permanent deal where you know you're actually going to be in their life and you can say, now I want to introduce you because she is going to be in our lives from now on. Uh, we've gotten to that point. Nicole uh, said that's what she wanted. And I think she's, I saw a pretty good amount of respect and I didn't see her nasty about Shannon either, just that she was like, hey, you know, if you can work it out, work it out. Um, and, you know, kids need to be near their mom, you know. Uh, so she said a lot of very rational things. I think she was a pretty rational, intelligent person who unfortunately hooked up with a very probably charismatic psychopath who she thought truly was separating from his wife. And that kind of sucks because now she's probably learned that lesson, but what a crappy way to learn that lesson. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to look through here for the rest of the comments and see if I missed anything. Uh, oh yeah, that's a good point. Amber, you're right. He's a liar. <laughs> he lied to everyone in his life for his entire life. She believed him just like everyone else always had. Unfortunately, it turned into the worst possible outcome. That is absolutely correct because this is what psychopaths do. They lie to everyone and they're practiced. At a certain age, they are actually very practiced at lying. And so they know what works and what doesn't work. And one of, oh, one of the interesting things he did, which is also very true of the psychopaths, he expressed his love for Nicole like really quickly, like within a couple of weeks. He's like, I love you, I love you. And she's like, should I say, I kind of have a hot form, but I don't know, should I say I love a man? I kind of feel that way. Psychopaths often will fall in love with somebody very quickly, um, not because they're in love with them, but because they want them. And I, when I say want, I mean as an object. That is something they want in their lives. It's going to make them feel good. That's going to, you know, change their life for whatever reasons. And of course, we all feel that way to some extent. But with psychopaths, it's really, really strong. And something to also understand, not only did he not 
likely did not love, well, I'm not going to say likely, he did not love Nicole. He did not love Shanann. He did not love his kids. Psychopaths do not love the people in their lives. They use them. They don't have that kind of empathy and feeling. They use them to amuse themselves, to make their lives better. Uh, either for whatever reasons that amuses them. They want to be successful in society because that makes them feel good. Success might mean getting married. Success might mean having children or whatever they think at that moment in time, what makes them special in the world, what makes them cool. So they will profess love that they don't feel. They know what you're supposed to say. They watch, they pay attention, they know, see what works and they say those things and they don't necessarily mean, well, again, they don't mean it, not necessarily, they don't mean it. And it's very hard for us to understand that because if you're not a psychopath, well, if you're a psychopath, you still don't understand it, but if you're not a psychopath, it's hard to imagine. No, we love our children. How can you, how can you be around your children for so many years and then just kill them? I mean, how could you do that? Well, you can't because you don't, you can because you don't love them. You, you know, if, if, if you, if you don't have real or true feelings, it's easy to get rid of things you don't have feelings for. And he might claim he has feelings for them, but he doesn't. And it just doesn't. So, you know, uh, so we, we are going to have a hard time understanding that because it's, it's such a bizarre thing that, you know, you just have to, you have to understand it intellectually. You can't understand it emotionally. And, and that's the way it is. So I, as a profiler, criminal profiler, understand these things intellectually. I've studied them, done research. I've been around them. I understand how they think and how they feel. But emotionally, I, you know, I'm just like the rest of everybody. I'm like, how could you do such a horrible thing? Because that's, you know, the emotions and intellect uh, and, uh, and uh, think, thinking things through intellectually are two different things entirely. Let me see if anybody else had these things. I'm not sure. Whoa. There's some really creepy stuff. I don't think I'll put the creepy ones up here, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, guess, I mean, they're interesting. You know, what, what you saw uh, on, on some of the chat about some of the behaviors that are, oh, Desiree, yes, a comment. Uh, the, from the behavior of Ronnie and Cindy Watts, I'd say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, um, psychopaths grow up in very interesting homes. They, there, there is some odd tendency to some of those houses. And one of the tendencies is, and this isn't always, but can be true, uh, that uh, for whatever reasons, that child, when they were very young, did not get the appropriate um, caring and love that they needed, oftentimes from the mother. And they, um, have a, get, they gain a detachment disorder very early on. Um, and because of that detachment disorder, what they learn after that is how to win because they don't know how they, they're not cared for in the way that people then develop feelings and, and uh, you know, could have think that other people are, you know, we, we give and take to other people. They don't get, they don't get the, anybody giving them enough. So then they just learn how to take and, and they develop a way to win and to beat the other people out. Um, sometimes in those homes you have, sometimes a, a mother says for some reason has been, he can go with overbearing in that instance. It's sometimes it's true. And also that she just didn't give the appropriate attention. And the father is often an adult who just sort of goes along with the program. Um, and so you could say, you know, people say, well, that could be true in a marriage. Well, it can be. Uh, you know, again, you could have, you could have Shanann being a strong woman or she could be overbearing because who knows? And he could be adult. But in this, you know, by the time they're grown up, the point being a psychopath is already a psychopath. You can't blame Shanann on anything. What, as far as his psychopathy goes and what he did to his family. That's just ridiculous because he's grown. So when you're a grown up person and you're, you know, you're making choices in life, you know, then you are responsible for your choices. You can't blame other people. When you're growing up as a child, those people can indeed uh, affect you very early on. And psychopathy develops, in my opinion, oh, by three, four years old, you already have that. You'll see very, you'll see little children sometimes three or four years old do some horrifically bad things like try to kill babies in their house because they're bigger than the baby and they don't like that baby. Uh, and so already the psychopathy is there. So, and it's one of those things you really, really, really want to prevent uh, by having a good family and by having loving care because you, you know, we do create to some extent psychopaths. Um, we don't know exactly all the reasons they develop into what they do, whether personality and the circumstances come together like a, like a, you know, like a hurricane or a tornado, and then they turn into that, um, or 
you know, because we don't exactly know. There are people who grew up in horrific circumstances and are wonderful people. So I think it's a weird combo. I don't think it's, um, some people say you're just born a psychopath, and I don't believe that. I don't believe you're born a blank slate either. So I think it's a mixture of personality and circumstances. And I don't know that we have a good explanation for it. Uh, they can keep trying, but I don't know that we do. What we need to do is provide the best loving care we can for children and, uh, and not let, let me point the right way this time, this one, not let, eh, I can't do it. <laughs> it's hard to do with a green screen and not let this kind of guy get into our lives and recognize the psychopathy, they, you will recognize, he does have psychopathic behaviors in any relationship over a certain period of time. So it's it's not like you're in a relationship and don't realize something's off with the guy, but you just, usually by the, by the time you figure it out, it might be too late. Although I will do some, I will do some future shows on the things to look for in early relationships. Um, uh, well, let me point out one, because this is one of my favorites and I'll point it out here because it's just, Shows a psychopath and a woman who hung out with him. There's a guy named, I think his name was Dave Bartoli. Uh, it's been a long time since I said his name. Dave Bartoli. I can't say it. It's a long name. Anyway, he was a serial killer in Virginia back in the 70s. And his wife describes going out on a date with him. Now, she, this, is, this is so freaking fun. I mean, in a sad way. Um, so, so the description is this. So they're going out on a date, the first date. And he says to her, check this out. And he pulls out his driver's license and he says, what do you think? And she looks at the driver's license and says, what about it? And he goes, I made it. Okay. Then she says, on our second date, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> why did you go on the second date? You know, why did you go on the second date? This should have been a big fat hint to you that you don't want to go on the second date. So but she goes, she goes on the second date. The second date, he pulls out a dollar bill from his pocket and he says, what do you think of this? And she goes, well, what about it? And she goes, I made this too. And she says, when we went out on our third date, I'm like, okay, you're just stupid. You know what I mean? The guy has already told you he's a counterfeiter. He's shown you he's a counterfeiter. And you want to go out with him again? Turned out he ended up torturing her um, and horrifically, horrifically torturing her in their marriage. And then he killed, he did counterfeit also lots of money. And then he killed a whole bunch of women because he was also a serial killer. I mean, the guy was a really, really scary guy. But the hint should have been, look at this. I made it. <laughs> but she didn't take the hint for whatever reason. So there is often, there are often signs, but people just, you know, don't want to, they don't see them or because they have their own needs. Like loneliness, you know, you're lonely. And you finally, this guy pays attention to you. You think, oh gosh, finally I met somebody. And they have a few things that you don't like. Like maybe he's a little, you know, uh, self-centered or, or he keeps telling, he keeps telling you what to do or whatever. And you say, well, you know, but you know, he, he's, he's pretty cool. Cause he does this A, B, C, and D right. And so you start, you know, justifying why you're good, why you're in that relationship. And, and so you stay in because you're, you're, you're lonely. Uh, usually people get stuck in relationships they shouldn't be in because they're needy. And if you, oh, if you remember, what did Shanann say about her relationship? Why she got, with, what was so wonderful about Chris? She was in a bad place. She was having health problems. And then Chris came into her life, you see? And Chris was cared for her. And he was the most wonderful guy that ever existed. She was very needy at that moment in her life. And Chris filled that need, which, you know, in reality, we all have, needs and we all do have some you know again give and take with people but that's why women and men get hooked up with psychopaths i always think it's kind of funny we often think of women you know marrying the psychopath but there's a lot of men who do that and for example the uh the black widow types i think one of the funny ones is when the guy said well you know i was 60 years old and uh i'm really overweight and i have like health problems and uh then this woman came online and she was only 35 but she told me, you know, she's looking for a man like me and uh, a man who has a job and she likes my dog and she likes to watch football and she likes beer. Yeah, what a deal. And then she kills him <laughs> you know? after she gets into his life and she kills him off. You know, and you're like, well, why did he go with that woman? Well, hey, what what overweight six year old guy wouldn't like a 35 year old woman who loves football, dogs and beer? She knows what to say. She doesn't say things like, oh, I don't like watching football. I, personally, I like cats. You know, 
She's going to say whatever you want because she's sucking you in. And that's what a psychopath is good at doing. So one has to be very careful not to rush into relationships with people. Give, to, give it some time because, you know, if you don't go with them, a lot of times they'll disappear because it's too much work to get you and they can find somebody else. So, you know, take, take your time on those kind of things. I'm going to see if there's any more questions before we I sign off here. Let's see. It was, what do we have here? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, that's a good, that's a point. Uh, where, wait, wait a minute. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, there's so, somebody, some are asking about some, some cases, which I'm not even sure. Oh, that's a good point. Um, so is it an entirely different animal for Andrea Yates? Yeah, Andrea Yates. Uh, Women, women psych have psychopathy too, and they express it in a different way. Uh, some people don't realize, for example, women are serial killers too, not just helping out their boyfriends kill off people. But when, when you have a thing called Munchausen syndrome by proxy, where women kill one child, after, one baby after the next baby after the next baby, you have to say, why do they do that? It's because, they, again, they don't have those feelings for their baby. They don't love those babies. What they do is they want to get pregnant because when you're pregnant, everybody goes, oh, my gosh, you're pregnant. Hey. And then you have a party, you know, you're a pregnancy party. And, and then you have the baby and everybody's like, oh, you're having a baby. And then they say, oh, what a cute baby. And then after a while, that baby's just work. So if the baby dies, then you get a great funeral and you get a lot of sympathy and support. And then you can start the whole process over again. So Mary Beth Tinning did it nine times. And they didn't figure that out until she, her ninth child died, who she had adopted. So they're like, oh, maybe it isn't genetic. You know? <laughs> so, but, you know, she was getting all that attention. People want power and control. Um, and people get power and control in different ways. And men tend to get things different for power and control than women tend to. Uh, so a lot of times with women in certain situations, um, in Andrew Yates' situation, she... She decided, I think, to get back at the husband who she felt wasn't giving her the proper support. And she had to deal with all those stupid children. And she decided one day she would just get rid of all the children. And then she would be free. And and, and that indeed that to some that is pretty much what happened. And what ha what happens with women is we refuse to believe women are psychopaths. So we usually say they had some kind of emotional breakdown because we can't imagine even more so than imagining men killing their children. We can't imagine women killing their children. So a lot of times we make excuses for them and they can be just as cold blooded as men. We just don't see it to a certain point. So, um, you know, Andrew Yates, uh, an interesting case. And I have, I have to look back on that one day and uh, maybe I'll do that as one of the, uh, one of the, uh, women, women killers. Uh, cause I, I haven't, I, it's been a long time since I've seen all the details exactly how it all happened. But women, can be, they can be psychopaths too. So don't ever believe that they can annihilate their families. They just don't do it as often. Uh, somebody asked here, um, this is London Girl. Hi. Uh, hi, Pat. Do you think he's a narcissist or a sociopath? Uh, but uh, there's a weird thing about labeling. He is a narcissist because narcissist narcissism is the major component of psychopathy. And some people call it sociopathy. Uh, they tr some people make a distinction between a psychopath and a sociopath, and I've seen absolutely zero reason to do that. They tend to call people sociopaths who are smarter. <laughs> you know, that's basically it. They're more educated, so they call them a sociopath. Uh, psychopaths, they just think of them as more, I don't know, more physical or something. Uh, they they claim, for example, uh, uh, let's say you have a church leader or a, a politician and he a, is able to manipulate people and get where he's going and get money from them or whatever. And they say, Oh, he's a sociopath. Well, he didn't kill anybody. Well, that, you don't have to kill. You can be a psychopath and not kill people. So sociopath, I think is just a fancy term for psychopath and a narcissism is the number one trait of a, of a, of a psychopath. So you got to be narcissistic. Now there are narcissists who aren't psychopaths because they're not quite that far down the road they have a problem with narcissism but they're not completely out to lunch so yeah so i would say yeah he's a psychopath and he definitely is a narcissist too um let's see what we have here let me say the last few here what i'm not sure i understand that one so i'll have to let that one go 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about Prince Harry. Uh, one, one of my rules on this new channel is I'm not doing anything that has to do with politics. That way we can all just focus on what's happening and not let that stuff get in our way. So there'll be no politics on this channel. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, do I see? Oh, do you think? Let's see here. Um, do you think he wanted high French martini? I like the concept of that. Um, do you think he wanted to stage a murder suicide blaming Shanann? Uh, well, <laughs> if he's going to do that, I think he needs to use a gun. I mean, because you can't strangle yourself. <laughs> you know? I mean, he could have killed the kids and then hung her and tried to claim that. I don't think so. I think he was going with the, I'll kill them all and then I'll just get rid of their bodies and say they, you know, we were having trouble and they went away. He just did it so badly. I mean, which again is, is something that psychopaths don't think through. They don't, they, they, they forget to think through all the details. I mean, once in a while you run into a character who really does a good job, but a lot of them just overlook those issues because they're just so hell bent on whatever they want to do. Um, uh, Judith, love listening to the psychology of these criminals. You're excellent. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Lucy, I believe Watts acted alone. He was capable of it. Absolutely. I mean, there, there are psychopaths who will work with somebody, but they tend to prefer to be alone because they they think they're good and they don't think the other person is. I mean, they don't trust the other person as well. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't some who ask for help. Uh, some, uh, sometimes uh, they'll ask a brother or a friend, uh, the, old, the old joke, you know, a good friend helps you move and a great friend helps you move bodies. There's a truth to that sometimes, especially if you can't move the body yourself. Um, eh, then there are those duos, you know, you've got couples who commit crimes and you have um, duos that commit crimes. Uh, they do exist usually with a strong, one, one is a leader and the other one's a follower. Uh, it does happen, but a good portion of psychopaths don't really like other people. They don't want, they, don't, they won't, they don't want to compromise and negotiate with a partner. So unless they control everything, they don't really need somebody else to be involved with it because you can't trust them anyway. They'll probably rat you out, you know? So um, let's see. Oh, yeah, that's true. London girl. See, uh, Chris Watts is still playing people and he's the victim. That happens forever. And this is why I'm really offended by by um, uh, prisons that allow outside contact for mass murderers and family murderers and serial killers. I think they should only be able to communicate through their lawyer. And that's it. Uh, I, I, you know, it bugs me because they're allowed to go out to the public. They're they're allowed to communicate with the public, and they once they get in there, they know how to play a new game. So they will start playing everybody because they love the attention, and they're you know that's what they do. So you know they will continue this till the day they get executed, or if they don't get executed, they'll continue it for forty years. And some of them look. Ted Bundy got married in prison, and and he got the woman pregnant. He had a child. That's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. I don't understand why any of these guys have rights to have sex with anybody when they're in prison, but they do in certain places and they're allowed to get married, which I think is outrageous. I think once you committed this kind of crime, you just should be separated from society and we don't want to have to hear from you again. It should be, you should, it should be over. Um, let's see what else we got here. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand all the words and sentences, but thank you, Claire. <laughs> I love this. Thank you, Claire. That's great. You know, one of the fun things about this, um, compared to doing television, is in television, you really don't get to talk to anybody. You know, you get to talk to the producer who says, what do you think, Pat? And then you go on the show and the host asks you a question, and then they don't ask you the other questions that you really would wish they'd ask, and you don't have any time to even answer. And soon it's just over, and you're like, okay. I said one sentence and then I go home. So this is, is neat because I actually get to communicate with you and talk about the, anything in depth, which I think is the whole point. I mean, you know, it's like, it's more than entertainment. It's actually education. It's actually understanding the world. And uh, so I think this is really cool. It's a cool, I would, you know, thank you, Liz, by the way. Thank you, Liz. But I actually never thought of doing a YouTube channel. And a couple of weeks ago, Liz goes, Pat, you got to do a YouTube channel. I'm like, Wow, cool. <laughs> okay. You know, I never thought of that. And uh, now I'm here. So that's pretty neat. Uh, let's see. Oh, hi, Annie. Thank you, Pat, for doing these videos. We love hearing your stories. Oh, thank you, Annie. I appreciate that. 
for any of you who don't know, I actually know Annie very well because we went to Mongolia together and we were three weeks in Mongolia and China and we had an absolutely spectacular trip. I mean, it was just a memorable trip for the rest of my life and we had such fun. Uh, we had five, uh, five of us ladies and we had such a good time in the middle of nowhere. I mean, that was really cool. So, and we didn't run into any crime out there at all. So that was really neat. So, Cheryl, hi Cheryl. If you haven't yet, please give Pat a thumbs up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I'm hoping to continue doing this. I mean, as I say, it's a lot of work, but uh, you know, there, there is a point where um, you will get some help from YouTube to keep going. Uh, so the more subscribers and more thumbs up and all that, it very much helps out uh, to make sure that I can continue doing the broadcast. So. It's really fun. Oh, look at this. Oh, I like that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, I'll have subscribed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sassy. That's cool. And I'm so into this one. Um, wait a minute. Where'd it go? Hey. 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 <laughs> I want to see this one. Well, if you ever... Ah, come on now. See? I have to learn how to use this stuff. Oh, hi, Sassy. There you're back again. Um, and I appreciate that. What the heck? I just... I'm, I can't seem to hit this... You have to understand, my computer is a little small, and that's why I have to wear glasses. I can't see anything, and I'm I, I think I need to buy a really huge computer to, to do this on because it would be a lot easier. Because uh, it's really hard to deal with something really, really small. Oh, thank you so much. I see, and then things roll, and it's not so easy um, as you think. Uh, I hope Pat sees your question. I often wonder why he didn't lawyer up. You know. <laughs> um, that's there there he really did confess really darn quickly I, I will i will say that he did he i think he knew his goose was cooked i mean uh, essentially i think he just knew he screwed up um that's one thing psychopaths will do if you're interviewing them and you can you conf they said to him he failed the polygraph i don't know if he did or he didn't but um they said he failed a polygraph and apparently he thought oh crap you know now they're on to me and then he went to his next best game and they offered him the chance to say his wife, the wife did, made him do it type of thing. And, and he said, okay, I'll go with that one because maybe I'll get off with a lesser you know, sentence. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, they, they're, they think very differently than we do. They really do. Um, so it's amazing how many serial killers don't lawyer up. They really don't. They think, it, A, they can outsmart the police. So they, you know, so they get in there and they'll go, okay, I'll talk to you. I'm an innocent person. I'll just talk to you. And then they start lying in such a bad way that, <laughs> you know, the cops are like, what the heck? You know, you're just like, so you're saying some stupid crap. Um, so sometimes it's kind of easy to manipulate them if you know what you're doing and get them to screw up and say things that, you know, that are going to put them in, in more trouble. So they don't, they tend not to lawyer up. So that's kind of a normal thing for a lot of serial killers. They just don't. So, oh, <laughs> they were birth. What is it with Colorado? So many husbands kill their wives. Um, yeah, well, what's what's with the Chris name? You know what I mean? The S H wife names. You know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just the ones we see because I don't know. They got they got the attention, or we live in Colorado or something. I live in Maryland, so I know the ones that you know get killed off in in Maryland. So, um, oh, this is true. Uh, this is a good answer, Amber. I really think he thought he would be able to lie to them and the police because he, he did with everybody else. Crazy though. That is absolutely correct, Amber. You got it. They're, they're pathological liars, and they're, they're, they've lied so much. They assume that if I lie to you, you're going to believe me, because people do, because my wife did, and my girlfriend did, and my boss did, and all these people did. So I'm going to assume I can lie to you, and you'll, you'll, you'll buy it as well. So that's absolutely correct. It's, it's an arrogance that they have that they just, yeah, it's, it's true. They think that uh, they're smarter than everybody else. That's, that is exactly true. Um, and they say, but there any more questions I can answer here? I say, it's, I got to find some way to get these questions bigger because it's really hard to see. Well, I wanted to say somewhere along the way, French martini said something about making martini if I got to Scotland. And A, I'd like to get to Scotland and I take you up on that. Uh, if, I, if I can't find where you said that, but I think it's cool. I think it's cool. Uh, and I would, I, have, I would, I keep trying to get to Scotland. I just haven't made it there yet. So I'm just going to. Run through the rest of these. I think I'm going to call it a day. But I'm going to see if any. Oh, let's see. Let's see if there's anything else. Oh, oh, look at that. Oh, I got to check this out <laughs> before I go. 
Miss Mr. Shenonite. I went to Outer Mongolia once. By that, I mean they wouldn't let me in the proper Mongolia. I wasn't wearing a tie. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> but some people say, uh, why did you why did you pick Mongolia? And I said, you know, what I wanted to be able to say to people was, people say, oh, that's in Outer Mongolia. I go, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> Been there. It's not there. So, no. It's a fun thing to be able to say. I mean, you know, how often can you say that? So, oh, that's very nice. Uh, thank you very much, armchair detective. Enough is enough. <laughs> that's I like I like your statement on the cut. Uh, but I appreciate that. I, I hope I interesting enough to, to listen to. So, uh, and I hope I hope you're learning something from it. So I oh, guess okay. Let's see what where was this? Yeah. Uh, and I will do something. Oh, London girl, I have seen your take on Madeline McCann. That's what I'm. I'm as for those who don't know and love it. Yes, thank you. Oh, sometimes it's kind of funny when people talk about you know making money off of crime. And oh, you know, and there are people out here who do some wonderful things like Lizzie who, who do stuff for years and never take a penny for anything. And I, I think that's amazing uh, that there are people who make some money off of crime. Obviously I've done crime commentary on television and, and documentaries, which I have earned some money for and I've written some books. Uh, so that's there too. And, uh, but you know, people across the world, make money off of crime. It's called policemen, lawyers, social workers, I mean, you name it. People make money off of crime and victims. They do. I mean, it's just, I mean, that's, that's called work. Doctors make money off of victims. People get sick. They don't tend to them for free. They make a lot of money for tending to them. So, you know, teachers, because, oh, well, you're taking advantage of, you know, you say teachers are taking advantage of the children because they need to learn. No, we say they deserve to be paid. So people always make money off of a need in society. So, you know, yes, people make money off of crime. Um, but I find the Madeleine McCann thing is pretty funny because, you know, I wrote my, my profile of uh, Madeleine McCann, profile of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, which you can find at Smashwords and not Amazon because it was pulled from the market from Amazon. Uh, it's $2.99 at Smashwords. And um, Amazon had it stayed on Amazon. I probably would have made a lot more money, but the McCanns had it pulled off uh, claiming libel and Amazon freaked. But what's funny about this is people, oh, you have made money on this, this $2.99 book. And I'm like, look, if I wanted to make money on the Madeleine McCann case, I would have said the parents absolutely had nothing to do with it. Do you not think the McCanns might like to have an American criminal profiler on their side? Do you not think I couldn't have written a great book saying the parents were totally innocent and and uh, Madeline McCann was abducted by a sex offender. Don't you think I could have sold that book and the, Ma the McCanns would have left that on Amazon? You know, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Gonzalo Amaral, uh, the detective, the Portuguese detective on the Madeline McCann case, and I were going to write a book together. I actually did uh, make the whole proposal. Uh, my agent, my literary agent, took that out to, to the, uh, all the American publishers, and guess what? Not one of them would touch it because it questioned the McCanns involvement in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. So even though an American profiler and a, de a famous detective in more Portugal were going to write a book together, no one would touch it. But what, let's say Gonzalo Amaral and I decided we're going to say she was abducted by a, a pedophile. Don't you think that they, all the television people would jump on it and all the publishers would jump on it? And I'd make a crap load of money, you know? So if I really wanted to make money, <laughs> yeah. And I don't think I would go the direction I went on the Madeleine McCann case, but I stay with with, with, with the truth and, and nothing about the truth. So there we go. So, and I stick with that. Anyway, I'm going to let everybody go and I hope you're going to be back next week. I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about yet. I've got some plans, but I'm not quite sure what they are yet. Um, and so I'm going to, I will let you know during the week what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and, uh, if you have some ideas, as I said, you're welcome to put your ideas up here. Uh, and, you know, that that's good because I need the ideas of what you really want to hear about, what you want to know about. Um, and then, you know, well, I'll do that. I'll do that. And so it's going to be 3 o'clock on Saturdays, barring something interfering. And next time, hopefully, I won't end up on a black screen for five minutes. And also, um, I'm, we're going to I'm going to be putting out some other videos and the next video coming out, which I think I mentioned last time is going to be uh, profiling at the movies and I'm profiling Silence of the Lambs. 
I'm getting ready to do that. And it should be out on Wednesday, barring I say more interference of life, but I'm gonna try to get that out on Wednesday. So I say any ideas you got? Do it, put them out there and uh, I will see you hopefully next week live again. So bye everybody.